So what is an introduction for? Generally, the presumption is that I'm going to be presenting an overview of the speaker's work and life. But in the case of William Connolly, we have an author of 15 books and an editor of another half dozen, which stand out for their wide variety of engagements, including, just to name a few, language and politics, Nietzsche, democracy, neurology, St. Augustine, secularism, pluralism, global warming, emergence, and to my knowledge, the first use of a backslash in the title of a book that I had ever seen. He also blogs at the Contemporary Condition. He's a universally praised teacher at Johns Hopkins and an unfailingly polite and engaged attender of panels at conferences. You might be surprised to know that not every famous academic is all of those things. <laughs> so it would be impossible, truly, to summarize the man's work. And oddly, I'm not actually sure what such an introduction would be good for. Many people here have already read some of his books, and others would not be likely to turn to them merely by my listing a set of topics and titles. In fact, listing past works of a person now seems to me to be a strange and potentially misleading way to contextualize a speaker. So perhaps an introduction should do something different. Let me turn instead to Connolly's limbic system, the paleo-mammalian part of his brain. <laughs> In his 2002 book, Neuropolitics, Connolly util utilized Ilya Prigozhin and Isabel Stengers to argue for the political salience of affective bodily response along lines of imminence and proprioception. Connolly located these in a part of the brain called the amygdala, from whence affective responses seem to emanate. But recent neurological science has argued that the amygdala is connected to a wide network in the brain called the default mode network, which not only responds to effect, uh, affective moments, but serves to order and produce entire states of mental processes that seem to escape the immediacy of experience. In the words of one author, the DMN comprised the parts of the brain responsible for, quote, higher level metacognitive processes, such as self-reflection, mental time travel, rumination, and what philosophers call theory of mind, the ability to attribute mental states to others. So let me introduce William Connolly by stating that he has a highly developed default mode network. <laughs> he creates connections between events and concepts which take far-flying intuitive leaps. He imagines himself into the minds of Darwin and Augustine and William James. And he calls into being worlds which do not yet exist. In his writing, he will even shift points of view, writing for a few pages in the second person, for example. It's this ability, the second order metacognition concerning our socio-political world, that those of us who read whatever William Connolly writes have long appreciated. It's my hope, as an introducer, that you will come to share this approach. Oh my God. Uh, it can only be disappointing now, but uh, still. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh, that I was supposed to. Good. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, to, to Richard Bruson, for uh, inviting me to this conference. I'm really looking forward to it, though I'm, I'm not sure forward is the right word, but I anticipate it in some sense. Uh, and uh, think of it as a valuable, untimely conference. And uh, uh, thanks for that uh, introduction, uh, which I have no idea what to do with, but still, uh, thank you. Uh, and and I've been a little divided in my uh, in my preparation, kind of trying to pay it, not trying to pay attention to the, this very important conference and the Baltimore scene, which is constantly there. Uh, so I'm just going to start uh, and uh, human exceptionalism. 
Capitalist or communist mastery over nature, belonging to a beneficent world, deep ecology, secularism, and sociocentrism. These contending world pictures all demand fundamental revision today. What are the problems? Well, let us very briefly consider a couple of admirable exemplars from the history of political thought, uh, people that I admire very much and who I think participate a bit too much or have participated a bit too much in these phenomena. <clears throat> Marx, in his uh, masterful attempt to uh, enunciate the contradictions of capitalism, nonetheless uh, bypassed insights his early flirtation uh, with uh, swerves in nature in Epicurean thought might have provided. He, after the alienation essays, organized around uh, an organic model of species life, tended, the tendency was not always operative, to treat nature as a deposit of resources for human extraction, for technological control. That notion of nature is still very much with us. Uh, 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 that could be exploited more rationally, abundantly, and equitably in a communist society. Of course, there are counter trends and important subterranean moments in his thought that must still be mined today. Uh, but he did buy into the notion of gradualism with respect to non human processes. In that sense, he was a follower of the early Darwin of the Origin of Species. <laughs> Another thinker who I've admired for years and still draw upon. Weber, whose brilliant study of the origins, or at least consolidation, of industrial capitalism in Northern Europe remains very pertinent to contemporary understandings of the evangelical capitalist resonance machine in America at this very moment. Uh, he uh, contended, of course, that Calvinism played a key role in the managerial worker and consumption practices needed during a period of capitalist accumulation. In that respect, he trumped in advance secular theories that tacitly insist that the explanation of social processes must themselves draw only upon secular forces so that the investigators do not slide into the slippery topics of religion metaphysics, and ontology. To many sociocentrists, such zones are peripheral to the serious business of explanation in the human sciences. And since non-human planetary processes, such as climate, species evolution, ocean currents, glacier flows, bacteria flows, and water uh, self-filtration processes are seen to be set on long, slow time, gradualism, they can be discerned as part of a stable environment for modes of explanation that concentrate on determination by uh, social factors. So Weber cracked that mold a bit with his exploration of resonances between Calvinism and early industrial capitalism. Nonetheless, he assumed that the non-human processes noted above form a settled background of human activity. Sure, as he said, Techno-industrial capitalism could intervene in nature, that's the storyline that many adopt, could, uh, inter intervene in nature until finally it used up, as he puts it, the last ton of coal. But for him too, this is an intervention in processes that in themselves move on long, slow time. Sociocentrism in the human sciences demands a gradualist image of planetary processes to be. In so doing, it underplays multiple interacting, nonlinear, non-human processes that may remain stable for a while and then shift more rapidly. Uh, it would be very pertinent, of course, to add economists such as Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, John Maynard Keynes, and Larry Summers to this list. Though Karl Polanyi, among others, represents a partial break with this tendency, in the middle, in the in, in the, the uh, middle of the century, last century, Hayek, for example, did note the role of self-organization in species evolution, in science, and in language, but he neither brought periodic high points in social movements to bear on economic processes, 
nor allowed the periodic volatility of non-human fields to disrupt his magical equation between market self-organization and impersonal rationality. Cultural internalism and human exceptionalism in the humanities have followed complementary trajectories until recently. Such tendencies are discernible in the work of Hannah Arendt, Walter Ben Michaels, George Katev, uh, Jürgen Habermas, John uh, Rawls, and even my buddy Michel Foucault to some degree. Until recently, Judith Butler participated in that orientation. So these tendencies toward internalism can cut across the historicist, universalist, post-structuralist debates with which we are so familiar. Cultural, in internalists, uh, cultural internalists worry, properly so, about how reductionism in the natural sciences and even social sciences squeezes out space for human agency, dignity, freedom, creativity, and political enactment. But they respond to these dangers by turning away from active work in philosophy, neuroscience, and complexity theory that first refashions human agency by exploring multiple micro-agents within it, and second, identifies large non-human partially self-organizing processes that periodically break to forge faithful, or, uh, fortunate or faithful uh, conjunctions with capitalism, democracy, and freedom. The internalists also repress the temptation to pour an aesthetic element into several non-human processes, though Darwin himself already did so in 1871 when he modified the early version of his own theory uh, that had been oriented only around natural selection and survival of the fittest. The exception was demean non-human aesthetic relations so as to monopolize agency, dignity, purpose, meaning, and art artistry for the human estate alo alone. We must be the only artists, poets, and bearers of meaning on the face of the earth, they insist, and it is killing us. This story about sociocentrism, exceptionalism, cultural internalism, and its mere images in the natural sciences, gradualism, and scientific reductionism could go on and on. It certainly needs to be given much more nuance and qualification than I have done, since we are really talking about differential propensities here, rather than uniform commonalities. <coughs> Nonetheless, let's turn to recent work in geology, paleontology, and species evolution that calls a couple of these background assumptions into question. So this next section is called Extinction Events and Bumpy Temporalities. <clears throat> Charles uh, Lyell, and that's Lyell, take a good look, and Charles Darwin, respectively, the great 19th century geologist, geologist and uh, theorist of species evolution, were both gradualists about geological and species change. Lyell rejected the wild theories of one predecessor, Cuvier, about a series of periodic catastrophes in nature, led by the extinction of dinosaurs and others. Darwin finally folded sexual and aesthetic uh, elements into evolution with the publication of Descent of Man, but uh, be, being a critic of uh, neo-Darwinism before the letter. But he nonetheless retained a gradualist outlook with respect to species evolution. Extinctions are gradual, and as Michael Benton, the geologist, says about him, they are tied to an overall advance in the complexity of species at the top of the pyramid. Gradualism and progressive complexity. Indeed, Charles Lyell's uh, expression tells you that he thought that uh, Victorian England was at the top of, of <laughs> species evolution. <laughs> Early critics of gradualism, including Henri Bergson, pounded away at the problem of how the evolution of one organ could be gradual and unilateral unless it was intimately involved with a set of others, uh, rather rapid shifts in organs uh, with which it was intimately involved. But Bergson's objections were generally thought to point merely to sore spots in the dominant theory. 
Critiques of gradualism surfaced sporadically uh, until as late as the early 1980s. They, as you know, then, as you know, an essay appeared by Luis Alvarez, a physicist, about that huge asteroid in Mexico that wiped out dinosaurs and several other species rapidly 65 million years ago. About 50% of life disappeared during a short period. So, uh, so the first 20th century shock within science itself to gradualism occurs. After a period of intense debate, the rapid extinction of dinosaurs became established. Here was a mass extinction event over a short period followed by a significant turn in the very trajectory of evolution. If such instances were, uh, were mul multiplied, species evolution would now look more like a series of interacting bumpy temporalities uh, bush bushing out in several directions than a single linear tree of, 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 of with a gradual trajectory. As you know, uh, new examples arrived quickly. Today we are participating in a new mass cross-species extinction event triggered by extractive capitalism, a, near, a new era of climate change uh, imbricated with it, and the loss of evolutionary niches for a variety of species. So can exploration of previous extension events Extinction events, extensions are nice too, but extinction events help us to cope scientifically, politically, and existentially with the, anthrop with the Anthropocene. So let's look at just a bit more closely at two previous events, the great extinction 250 million years ago and the much more recent decimation of our kissing cousins, the Neanderthal. I tiptoe into this literature, of course, as an amateur entering a domain that remains unsettled, that I'm uncertain about, and yet is highly uh, pertinent to the shape of the human sciences and the humanities, both. So 250 million years ago, uh, up to 90% uh, of life was extinguished over a short period in geological time. The, the causes of this devastation are still being debated, and indeed it only became an object of close uh, exploration recently. Uh, hypotheses of another major asteroid uh, impact do not seem to be supported by much evidence. One scenario leaks the event to a series of methane bursts that occurred after a rapid period of global warming. The warming period had itself been triggered by volcanic eruptions in Siberia, the Siberian traps, re releasing huge amounts of balsat and basalt and other gases into the air. This event uh, alone, however, did not suffice to cause the extinction. The repeated eruptions, rather, may have warmed the air over the Antarctic Ocean enough to lift the ice cover over methane fields there. As Michael Bent Menton, the geologist uh, and recent <coughs> critic of gradualism, contends, uh, we take a last look at Lyon. Uh, Sorry. Uh, no. Uh, this is the quote from him. Release of carbon dioxide from the eruption of the Siberian traps led to a rise of global temperatures of 6 degrees Celsius, or about 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Cool polar regions became warm, and frozen tundra became unfrozen. The melting might have penetrated to the frozen gas hydrate reservoirs located around the polar oceans, and massive volumes of methane may have burst to the surface of the oceans in huge, uh, in, in huge bubbles. This further input of carbon <coughs> into the atmosphere caused more warming, so the process went on running faster and faster. The natural systems that normally reduce carbon dioxide levels could not operate and eventually the system spiraled out of control with the largest crash in the history of life. So triggers with self-amplifying processes. There's a picture of the, one of the Siberian traps. As the maze in the above quote suggests, this remains a speculative theory. Though the evidence of a double whammy followed by a series of self-amplifying processes seems stronger than that so far offered in support of other theories. Moreover, there also seems to be solid evidence of such a methane burst 
55 million years ago with severe effects of its own. The possible pertinence of an event 250 million years ago to today is twofold. It shows how triggering events followed by a series of positive amplifiers can issue in uh, devastating results for several species. And it calls attention to uh, independently stated concerns that the contemporary pace of global warming could once again release methane bubbles now covered uh, over by the ice or sedimented under a cool ocean. Indeed, the temperature increases during that period are close to those now projected for 2100, if nothing radical is done soon to reduce the human import, input of CO2 into the atmosphere. One difference, however, is that there are 7 billion people on the planet now, up from merely 5 <coughs> million at 800 BCE and 3 billion in the 1950s. Another is that late capitalism is currently based upon fossil extractions and CO2 emissions that triggers large-scale amplifiers in ocean currents, climate, glacier flows, biological evolution, and the bumpy intersections between them. A second event is closer to home. Around 28,000 to 24,000 years ago, the last of the Neanderthals were extinguished. If you are part of a generation over 50, you are likely to have assumed, as I know I did, or as I now know I did, I didn't know it at the time, that they disappeared either because they were vanquished by Homo sapiens <coughs> or because they were not intelligent enough to survive the competition for food in a roughly stable environment. We Homo sapiens are so smart and or so militarist. Either Either story paints a triumphalist view of humanity, or of one of its types, in a way that recalls the old stories of how dumb dinosaurs bit the dust before the discovery and dating of that asteroid cavity. Homo triumphalism uh, on the way to new triumphs in the, pit, uh, in the future. Hmm. Uh, the emerging picture is rather different I was supposed to show that Antarctic uh, uh, shelf a, a couple minutes ago, so I'll just take a peek at it. It'll be gone in a second. The emerging <laughs> picture is rather different, though it too is replete with uncertainties filled with speculation. According to Clive Finlayson, the Homo sapien Neanderthal split started around 600,000 years ago. Then each evolved into its classical shape. They occupied adjacent land for a while, a short while, in the Mideast, or where some uh, one-night stands and intraspecies reproduction occurred. Of course it's intraspecies according to the definitions of species if you could have reproduction. As the climate cooled 125,000 years ago, Neanderthal were pressed to retreat to warmer areas. Why? <coughs> they had larger brains than Homo sapiens, though the ratio of cerebellum to cerebral size differed between the two groups. One Neanderthal site in Jersey, currently an uh, island off the shore of England, but then uh, an isthmus connecting England to the mainland, reveals how Neanderthal organized complex hunts for woolly mammoths by forcing them to stampede until they tumbled over a high cliff. Then they, set up, then they cut up, barbecued, and ate them while warding off other predators. Such feats involved extensive foresight, improvisation, and organization skill. The rather rapidly changing climate and their stocky builds combined to make life tough on the Neanderthal. That build had suited them. I thought I had a picture of that. There you go. They're stocky guys. Uh, that build had suited them for warm periods when they could stop and kill large animals on the edge between forests and plains. But cooling wiped out the large animals, or at least forced them elsewhere. And the Neanderthal strongholds contracted to the south, uh, uh, which contained clima climatic possibilities consistent with their body type. The last hurrah for the uh, Neanderthals occurred on Gibraltar, an area that retained its warm weather longer. Some 
had, had lived there for 125,000 years at least, as the remarkable layers of temporal evidence on the Gorman Cave show. By, uh, this is a quote from Finlayson. By 40,000 years ago, their homeland had been pinned back to the Mediterranean, southwest France, and pockets around the Black Sea. The acceleration of cold and unstable conditions after 37,000 years ago reduced uh, the range even further, leaving a major stronghold in southern and eastern Iberia and, and, and pockets in northern Iberia, the Atlantic seaboard to the north. By the time we reached the end of our period, 30,000 years ago, the only Neanderthals left were in southwestern Iberia. Between 28,000 and 24,000 years ago, the remnants became extinct, perhaps from a disease that wiped out the weakened few. Finlayson's thesis is that dissonant conjunctions between body type, hunting methods compatible with that type, the loss of large animals, and rather rapid climate cooling did in the Neanderthal. He says that there was a lot of luck in contingency in how things worked out. By that, I think he means that while each of the force fields in play, climate change, animal location, and possible migration patterns, body type, hunting instruments, pace of evolutionary change, was fairly explicable, Volunt a volatile conjunctions between them created new situations that rapidly favored some groups and threatened others. Even if you add, as Terence Deacon, and I would, as a follower of him, uh, uh, a teleodynamic element in species evolution itself that makes each new shift in species evolution only partially explicable in principle, the fate of the Neanderthal was shaped by a series of dissonant conjunctions and the variable speeds at which they occurred. We did not triumph over the Neanderthal in a stable environment, nor did we wipe them out in a series of genocidal battles, according to the text I'm examining. Our weak, slim body type, ability to forage and hunt, result in emergence of village sites of activity and prevention, invention of projectile and nomadic hunting launched an unplanned growth in the Homo sapien population on the cold plains. What if the climate had entered a, a rapid warming period? Or if that warming had produced new and highly contagious diseases? Or if a new series of volcanoes and methane bursts had occurred? Homo sapiens might not have been the lucky species as it was in that fact. So the question that we need to ponder is, are we the Neanderthals of today? Packing seven billion uh, onto the face of the earth during a period when capitalist emissions trigger non-human amplifiers with irreversible propensities of their own. Climate change is very rapid, fossil fuel use is growing, and the prospect of conflagrations is severe between people trying to emigrate from low-lying zones and militant countries aggressively protecting their territories. So um, now we move to the last section, upbeat section, <laughs> humanist, humanist nihilism and entangled humanism. Humanist nihilism and entangled humanism. Humanist exceptionalism, to rework an idea drawn from Charles Taylor, is the idea that we are either the one species favored and nourished by the grace of God, as long as we obey, or a divinely unprotected species so superior to other forces and beings that we can deploy them endlessly for our purposes. We are endowed with language, rights, dignity, meaning, creativity, uh, artistry, and impressive explanatory prowess. Uh, they, they are either useful to us as objects or so inferior that we do not need to think about them intrinsically. The old Euro-American debate between utilitarianism and Kantianism, for example, was, until very recently, largely a debate within humanist exceptionalism. I grew up with that debate. Sociocentrism, cultural internalism, 
and humanist exceptionalism complement one another amidst their differences. They provide the shifting matrix within which is a series of provincial debates and omissions occur. My question is this. Does humanist exceptionalism, in both its divine and secular versions, in both of the versions, run the, grace, the grave risk of becoming a new mode of nihilism during the era of the Anthropocene? To pursue that question, I draw sustenance from Nietzsche's 19th century account of nihilism and also freely work upon it. Nihilism, the sense that all meaning has been subtracted from the world, emerges when a set of uh, institutionally entrenched practices and projections have been rattled severely by new events and experiences. The culturally imbued need might be the belief that God infuses the world with divine meaning and grace, or that Christ will soon return, or that the eternal laws of the natural world are all knowable by, knowable by us in principle or that the world is an organic whole of intricate connections to which we belong when we tread lightly on it, or that history is set on a progressive a trajectory of mastery over nature. With, uh, with uh, positive outcomes, we can vaguely discern on a singular horizon, or that post-humanism will allow us to enter into a rather smooth network of connections with other species and forces. If and when the culturally infused need is intense and belief in the actuality is threatened, nihilism emerges as a possible force. It is the sense that one or more of the de of <coughs> demands is utterly indispensable to endow life with meaning, but that it is not available. Since effectively toned beliefs express varying degrees of complexity and completeness, uh, within uh, different aspects of the, of the body, brain, subsystems, since these systems are connected to each other by dissonant relays and loops, the expression of nihilism can be conflicted with transcendence of old beliefs on some of the refined layers punctuated by uncanny expressions of the remnants on others. One expression today is aggressive nihilism. The temptation to aggressive nihilism now arrives not only from threats to the existence of God or to the loss of organic belonging or to doubts about the economic projects of mastery and abundance. It also comes from the palpable sense that the advent of the Anthropocene throws a series of contending projections of human progress into jeopardy over a short period of time, while our most basic practices are themselves organized around those projections. Aggressive nihilism, familiarly enough, often responds to those shocks to meaning by upping the ante of deniability, by attacking the messengers. I just heard a talk by Michael Mann a few days ago detailing the attacks uh, he was faced by uh, from, the, from the radical right, uh, including a series of subpoenas to, to release all of his emails uh, after he had written his book on the hockey stick uh, in the 90s. Uh, it, it was an excellent talk in terms of capturing the strategies that aggressive nihilists adopt. Uh, yeah, we, we hear it in more generic ways with drill baby drill, as the young lively vice presidential candidate repeated the election stops in 2008. And frack, 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 frack us that is the new dominant version of the same demand. The most extreme version <coughs> of aggressive nihilism may be inhabited uh, and exacerbated by a half-formed whisper, what I'm calling these remnants. Either we retain what is or we let the whole thing collapse. The fossil fuel companies, the dominant voices in neoliberalism, Fox News, and the right edge of evangel evangel take the lead here. The most obvious danger of aggressive nihilism, of course, is that it will carry the day until it is too late. But a second, more subtle danger is operative. The repeated expose of aggressive nihilism by its critics, which is what I've just been doing, while important, may also excuse others <coughs> of us 
from confronting the uncanny strains of passive nihilism that inhabit us. I think I might have heard something like that in some of Richard Rusin's comments. For we too may be inhabited by propensities to grieve the loss of a world that can be no longer. I mean to suggest then that those tempted by the competing and complementary tendencies towards sociocentrism, cultural internalism, gradualism, exceptionalism, secularism, providentialism, and anthropocentrism viewed so briefly above are today vulnerable to the temptation of passive nihilism, even as they fight off and we fight off the aggressive nihilists. The passive nihilist had internalized the need to identify meaning and purpose as such with an ingrained set of cultural practices and projections. Nihilism, Nietzsche said, as a psychological state is reached when one has posited a, a systematization, any, indeed any organization in all events, and a soul that longs to admire and revere in some supreme form of domination and administration. And to quote, now however, however, that ground is pulled away. But more is also involved in passive nihilism. For Nietzsche, the philosophical nihilist is convinced that all that happens is meaningless and in vain. And there ought not to be anything meaningless and in vain. But whence this there ought not to be? From where does one get this meaning? This standard, <coughs> the second order proto-thought and demand may flow from molecular residues persisting within us of the very ontoperspective subdued at a more refined cognitive level. The, uh, the second order thought is effectively dense and cognitively unsettled. This indeed is how Nietzsche dramatizes molecular affective tendencies of proto-thought. Uh, that have heretofore uh, formed channels of connection to more refined modes. You tap into such half-formed propensities on the way, not by knowing them, but by dramatizing them. You dramatize them to test the, uh, the energetic residues and see what reactions unfold. Deleuze does the same thing. We communicate culturally across such molecular tiers, too through gestures, tonality of voice, the unconscious choice of words, the visceral responses to stress, so that the visceral or molecular dimension of life operates both within the social structure of selves and uh, the lower registers of cultural communication. The media function as collective amplifiers here, as you see for the last several days in the discussion of my hometown. Passive nihilists are weakened, anxious beings who may doubt a providential God, or the Kantian subject, or human exceptionalism, or sociocentrism, or an organic world, or a world of human mastery. But the reason they do not invest vigorously in alternative paths of meaning, responsibility, and action may be because stubborn residues of past demands resist embodied exploration of those very possibilities. They and we seem now to resist what Gilles Deleuze would call pursuit of restoring belief in this world. We ought not, say, to inhabit a world with severe limits to human mastery. We ought not to face the risk of human extinction. To both tap and challenge the, this, this visceral register, it may be necessary to dramatize dramatize res residues that contain incipient pluripotentialities on the way. That is why Nietzsche wrote in the cinematic style he did. Since interpretation here is always exaggeration, the tendencies of such energetic residues must be sounded out more than known. Nietzsche again tries to touch su such uncanny zones through uh, strategic strategies of dramatization and arts of the self. That's what Zarathustra is all about. Buddhists through mindfulness and lucid dreaming. Deleuze collectivizes such pursuits through micropolitics. <coughs> William James and Judith Butler, in different ways, enact public experiments to attract 
and inspire us. My sense is that today the shock of the Anthropocene helps to foster seedbeds of passive, passive nihilism in the academy, in everyday consumption priorities, in finance and investment portfolios, in many churches, in most university presidents, <laughs> uh, in political parties, and in uh, several spiritual priorities. These seedbeds contain thick residues of effective negativity joined to relatively unformed thoughts on the way that are channeled, channeled by the past connections they had uh, to insinuate themselves into uh, our uh, rationalizations of inactivity. Anyway, uh, during the Anthropocene uh, and the dangers of uh, passive nihilism, it may, be, uh, it may be unwise for us to jump past humanism simply, or to move towards something called post-humanism or anti-humanism. Indeed, such a simple rejection, standing alone, could uh, fuel another variant of aggressive nihilism, one inhabited uh, by whispers of, it will, it will be over soon, so let's take care of ourselves as we ridicule modes of political activism anchored in the squishiness of entanglement and care. Today, perhaps, it is wise to transfigure old humanisms and gradualism to which they're connected into the themes of entangled humanism on a volatile and fragile planet. So I kind of uh, apologize for that long quote. Mm -hmm. uh, such a transfiguration acknowledges a world composed of innumerable bumpy entanglements, including the ancient bacteria imprisoned in our cells, mitochondria, other microagencies such as the bacteria in our guts and the olfactory senses that link our organs together as they flow into the thought-imbued moods of the more refined brain regions. The reptile brains within us that have evolved to form dissonant, effective lines of communication with more refined brain zones. Our relation to the Neanderthal, myriad modes of interspecies symbiosis and disease jumps, the agonistic respect and critical responsiveness needed in pluralist imbrications, the shift in gravitational pull as the Antarctic uh, ice sheets melt and pull a larger uh, uh, portion of the increase in ocean levels toward the temperate zones, and multiple other planetary partially self-organizing processes of climate, glaciers, ocean currents, water filtration processes, bacterial and viral flows, and spe species evolution that push back upon capitalist uh, systems. <clears throat> Each entanglement is increasingly known. No, I'm sorry, but those knowledges are also marked by mobile boundaries of remainder, noise, and uncertainty, particularly when the flows intersect. Such entanglements are periodically marked by bumps and accelerations. Some devotees of entangled humanism, there are only two of us so far, <laughs> some devotees of entangled humanism may embrace a god or gods of entanglements. I think William James and Catherine Keller do that. Others may be non-theistic. I think I, I would put Gilles Deleuze there. Others may pursue an imminent divine. Jean Fatimineau pursues such a track. And others yet, the theme of an imminent naturalism that is never apt to know the world completely. Every which way. Indeed, entangled humanism of the source, uh, I'm sorry, sorts thematized here seek to promote positive spiritual affinities across several real differences in creed for ethical, political reasons. <clears throat> Entangled humanists acknowledge limits to the human ability <coughs> to feel, perceive, think, know, judge, and respond in a world teeming with human and non-human modes of perception that overreach us and overflow us. But as numerous ethnographies and techno uh, artistic experiments have uh, begun to show we do not know in advance exactly what those limits are. We may be able to stretch our capacities of receptive experience enough to inhabit the experiential edge of other species, such as whales, vultures, crocodiles, yeast, and crows, 
without becoming attuned to any completely. Such techno-augmentations may intensify our experiences of interspecies entanglements. Entangled humanists, however, are wary of transcendental arguments that pretend to fix the boundaries of interspecies experiential engagements once and for all. That's human exceptionalism, given the recurrent defeats of such attempts in the past. As multiply entangled beings, we seek periodically to stretch the visceral habits of perception and identification from which our cultural judgments are forged, to work upon layered and congealed drives within and between us by tactical means, to open common sense to different modes of experience and attachment, to extend our knowledge of other species by confronting new work in allied fields, to enliven, to enliven the existential dimension of life, and to expose ourselves <coughs> to new events that may well rebound back on all of those endeavors. But what makes such a creed entangled humanism? Well, as we struggle to become worthy of the events we encounter, we also give a recurrently problematized degree of priority to the human species in these interdependencies and imbrications with other beings and forces that neither masters nor owns. We affirm care for the human estate in its worldly entanglements as we seek to stretch that care beyond human exceptionalism and toward <coughs> other species with which we are entangled. The, thus, the symbiotic relation to the threatened vulture in India is valued in part because of the care for a species that remains ugly to many of us, and in part because its survival would curtail the spread of rabies and anthrax to poor people living in rural India. Entangled humanists are not moral purists of the sort uh, celebrated by the Kantian version of exceptionalism. There are several questions here. Uh, how to negotiate co uh, complex entanglements during the late Anthropocene, and how to mobilize a new pluralist militant assemblage that pursues ecological actions at multiple sites. The politics of swarming needed today may include vitalizing positive affinities of spirituality across differences in creed, pursuing role experiments to readjust church, consumer, teaching, entrepreneurial work, scientific, blog, parenting, and electoral priorities to meet the dictates of the Anthropocene, thinking about new ways to enter into symbiotic relations with other species and forces, and organizing a, uh, a, a cross-country general strike to press states, corporations, churches, universities, localities, consumers, and investors to pursue a, a series of rapid changes in their interim practices. As we move back and forth between role experiments and these other engagements, it is well to remember that the first pursuits, role experiments, make some cumulative difference in themselves, and, as may, when many practice them, <coughs> and they also work on those uncanny molecular dimensions of cultural life, so thick in affect. They thus work upon established modes of feeling, perception, and readiness to act. There are doubtless several other issues that must be pursued. I'm only going to engage one now. Does the politics of swarming pursued here project the potential of a new term in the future when we should, in fact, come to terms nobly with the irreversibility of, uh, of, uh, uh, of human actual <coughs> or near extinction? along with numerous species with which we are entangled. That is what Guy McPherson, a climate scientist, would almost certainly say. Extinction of the human species is already in the cards, he says. Powerful self-amplifying processes are now well underway that have become irreversible. It is time to learn how to die with nobility together. McPherson has not yet taught one old guy how to, con to inform his children, partner, students, grandchildren, and Facebook friends about such a future. I assume that we are not there yet. Such an assumption is partly grounded in shaky counter-evidence about possibilities of action, and perhaps 
partly in molecular protests against such a future. A trace or two of passive nihilism may thus fold into this combination. From whence comes this latter must? At the very least, I cling to entangled humanism in a way that suggests both that the attachment goes beyond casual belief and that such a belief is under threat during a fragile time. Let's give the politics of swarming and a cross-country general strike a try. Then, if that improbability proves actually to be impossible, we can retreat to the next item on the agenda. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. point about pluralism. So I was wondering if you could, split, could um, sorry, I was wondering if you could reflect on the pluralisms of the term anthropos that inform the Anthropocene since um, uh, 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 um, pluralism of the uh, of the idea of the Anthropocene I Yeah of the of when we talk about extinctions brought about by, by human change to speak about them in a yeah. species level, yeah. right? but then it, it seems to gloss over that the in an equal carbon footprint that, that humanity has, right? Oh, oh you uh, mean the fact that uh, that that uh, advanced capitalist countries are doing most of it, and and that other countries and other places are the the uh, invulnerable locations are the effects of these. Processes. Yeah, yeah. If, if talking in a nation state level, because you can also look in the smaller space, right, and see the, the structural inequalities there yeah. and how vulnerability is not well, is not distributed. Yeah. I'm entirely with you. It's just that I couldn't say everything on, yeah. on paper. I'm entirely with you on that. That the, uh, the, That's why it's so important today to figure out closely why the United States is the outlier, outlier even amongst uh, the oldest capitalist states. Germany is much better than the United States on that score. Uh, and so uh, I'm entirely with you on, on, on that issue. And, uh, and that's why I, I, I tend to think that the, uh, the politics uh, in the country we inhabit uh, is, is, is an important generator. Because uh, we're doing the most, especially over the longer term so far. And, and other areas are receiving the most. That's why I would try to publicize, and one of the reasons I would try to publicize this idea that the temperate zones are going to get harder, get harder than people thought, because you've got to hit people on multiple fronts at the same time, so that their perception, self-interest, and uh, ethical concerns will start radiating together. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but uh, the other thing that that uh, it, it's maybe important to see here in this context is that the other extinction events didn't have uh, anything to do with these early ones with human beings. And that's, that's the double reason that, that the advanced capitalist states are playing the fire, because, because it, they reveal the amplifiers that are at work. <coughs> the techno, the techno uh, uh, readings of nature, so where people say <coughs> nature has disappeared. Well, maybe I maybe I was going there once. I don't go there anymore. I'm done with that. that it, it, it underplays the self-amplifying processes that work in uh, in non-human uh, modes that are uh, that that affect, <coughs> but then take on a course of their own. But yeah, I'm entirely with you. It's just that I'm not I'm not emphasizing that in this paper. Oh, yeah. uh, thanks for that. Uh, when you talk about entangled humanism, it's hard for me not to hear a reference to Darwin's famous last paragraph, the Tangled Bank paragraph, with the great last line of, from these simple sources, endless forms, most beautiful have been and are being evolved. And the Tangled Bank, uh, you know, is a kind of a, a lyrical wind up there, and a lot of the struggle is gone from it. And I heard the struggle for survival kind of gone from your version as well. If you're grounding, 
tangled humanism in some way on a kind of evolutionary tangle or even a Darwinian tangle. I wonder what do you do with the competition and the struggle that's very much present in the rest of Origin of Species, but which you know, I hear kind of translated into interdependency in your talk. Um, well, I don't want you to hear it that way. Uh, I think that, uh, that despite uh, Darwin's uh, racism and tendency to think that Victorian England also was Lyle was, is at the top, uh, I, I think that uh, he, he did introduce a couple of uh, 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 inter interesting changes, but I think that, that we need to emphasize even much more the volatilities and the unpredictabilities that are operating in these processes today. Uh, because that's why I worry about the techno stuff if it's pushed too hard, because it sounds like we're still the only movers and shakers. So uh, and even if we can't master the processes. So uh, you, yes, uh, uh, I don't want you to hear this as, a, as a, a, a notion that says that if you focus on interconnectivity, uh, things could all be sweet and lovely. I'm a Nietzschean. I don't buy that for a minute. Uh, I, I, I think that, that what you have are a, a protein, and, and, and Nietzsche was critical of Darwin, not because of evolution, but because Darwin uh, underplayed the, the, the extent of the larger processes involved on the planet and, and the world. He, Darwin, Nietzsche was more ahead of his time than Darwin was. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, I don't think that there's a, uh, a, a root, if you, if you think of, the, of, of these uh, the connections and processes as having volatilities and surprising terms, I don't think that way at all. Uh, and, and one of the reasons that I think Jill Deleuze was ahead of his time was that he was telling us that we needed to work to restore belief in this world, which is a world of natural processes in periodic tumult. Uh, and we don't want that. We, we want to master it, or we want it to be benevolent, or we want it to be interconnected in a way that uh, we could just uh, uh, lighten our footprint and things would be okay. I, don't <coughs> uh, I want to uh, enter into pluralist alliances with people who do buy that world, but I don't. Uh, and, uh, and, and so that's why my last book is called The Fragility of Things. It's intrinsically the case. Yeah. Yeah, uh, on that note, um, in reference to um, your reference to the uh, pursuit of belief in Deleuze, um, I mean, isn't uh, I mean, what is it that makes a belief uh, symbolically efficacious? Uh, you know, don't uh, prohibitions do that, right? And that perhaps that um, our obstacle to moving towards um, uh, or, toward, or to responding in a, in a responsible and meaning uh, and effective way to climate catastrophe really has to do with the fact that um, we've already been freed by you know secularism, neoliberalism, uh, you know all the sort of movements and <coughs> emancipations from prohibitions, and that if you look at um, you know models of uh, you know complex societies in the past that you know were um, you know relatively you know, that were able to stay within a fairly uh, limited ecological footprint. You know, you find that they were they are rigidly hierarchical, right? Social mobility was not an option. Right? Thinking of uh, Tokugawa Japan is, is one uh, possible example. But but, uh, but what do you? Uh, but isn't that um, in some sense the, uh, the the problem of passive nihilism, right? That that this uh, that it's actually a condition of our freedom, especially in the way that we understand and have come to understand freedom today. Um, is it a condition of our freedom? In the in the way that we've come to understand freedom today. Um, that, that, that issue I would, I would like to kind of pursue with you in a, a longer uh, question, because the, the kind of the dominant notions of freedom in, uh, in, in kind of uh, Anglo-European uh, uh, political theory, at least, were kind of organized around positive and negative freedom, and that was the debate, and, and uh, they, they, they really downplayed, both of them, the element of creativity for positive modes and for destructive modes in freedom itself. And in doing so, uh, they, they, they were kind of uh, more apt to uh, not to come to terms with the limits of sociocentrism and the limits of uh, human exceptionalism, 
uh, because now you can have uh, creative turns in, uh, in, in other domains of life as well. So, uh, and you know, you might be right that, uh, that uh, uh, modes of life that uh, uh, respond to things like the Anthropocene uh, have always been hierarchical and have to be, but I don't think, and I'm not going to go that way myself. I, I, I you know, I would, uh, uh, I would rather die in the streets of Baltimore than going that way. <laughs> so that might be part of my passive nihilism again. Uh, so, but I, but I see your point, and and certainly uh, these, uh, the the uh, uh, old capitalist states have a lot to learn from uh, communities and modes of being uh, that are not capitalistic. I, I agree with that and accept that fully, but I wonder the insistence on hierarchy, unless I misheard you. I'd like to try to fend that off. That's why I think that today you can't build a counter movement uh, uh, around any kind of centered class or uh, other uh, site, uh, it has to be a complex pluralist assemblage. Uh, and, and that makes it complicated, perhaps improbable, but not impossible. That's what I'm hoping. Thanks. Um, yeah, Bill, thanks. That was great. Uh, so I really, you know, am with you, I think, probably pretty much all the way, or most of the way here, let's see. I definitely <coughs> think that not believing nature is gone, I'm with you entirely. I think we have to yeah. uh, get past this idea of the end of nature. But I guess my question is, I, I just really want you to elaborate a bit more, this idea of the general strike and embracing this notion of the politics of swarming, because in addition to these natural processes that are set in motion that, you know, independent of what we do, right. there are also a whole set of technical processes. Yeah. And so unless a general strike is more than a strike of humans, but unless the general strike actually can, in this politics of swarming, involve uh, shutting down or uh, even the destruction, perhaps, of all sorts of technical processes that continue to intensify and amplify the natural changes that are involved, then it seems to me that yeah. it, it misses a big chunk of things. And I I yeah. presume you agree with that, so I'd be interested in you agree talking with you, But I think you probably have thought about it more than I have, but, I, but, I, but I'm trying to kind of include it in my thinking. Uh, uh, the companion essay to this piece is called The Anthropocene and the General Strike, and it tries to look at people like uh, Gandhi and Sorel and uh, uh, Latour, actually, and I don't know, somebody else, uh, and, uh, and, and to try to kind of distill from them uh, ideas that could be appropriate for a new kind of general <coughs> that is that that none of them was really pursuing. So it could be for a class victory. It could be for the nation yeah, yeah. and and that sort of thing. And uh, and uh, the the, uh, the the kind of the the initial idea is that uh, there is not a lot of time, and and all kinds of forces. Uh, uh, that uh, congeal together, at least to some degree, uh, are, are involved here. Uh, and that uh, I think it's highly improbable event, but I think it's a necessary event. So why in the hell, I, I have tenure, I think you do too. But, uh, and, I saw, and I, I heard your talk. Uh, so why don't uh, some of us push this as hard as we can and characterize how it could op operate and what the constituencies could be and so forth and what we can learn from uh, uh, promises and then some successes uh, in this so in the past uh, that, uh, that that might help us but we would have to take creative uh, we would have to make uh, a creative adjustments in all kinds of things the, the pluralist assemblage you're not naming naming at a nation you're not naming at just a class you include a class within it and so forth uh, and uh, uh, I think I may have lost sense of one of your points, but uh, well, let me. I would just say, go with me on this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so let me elaborate just a little yeah. bit more. So, for example, I guess I saw on Facebook. Yeah, I saw on Facebook that uh, 
you know, there's been a uh, denial of service attack both on Rutgers and somebody said maybe Arizona State or something as well. So here's an example of a strike of non-humans, right, and a way in which we can ally sort of non-humans and technical agents in the act of strike. So in other words, students could strike and try to disrupt business as usual at the end of the semester by taking over the administration building, or faculty could not yeah. turn in grades. And I mean, these are all things that are yeah. effective uh, means of, I think, you know, opposition. But it's interesting to me that if there are these other kinds of means, so I mean, this is another part of the question I was asking. Um, where if you hack into a system, a system like that, that you can disrupt the university not through bodies, only through bodies on the street or in the administration, right. but through these technical non-human means. Right. So I guess what I want is to, well, to, to, to say we need to get the non-humans with us in the general strike. Yeah. So that, and by that I also mean things like, you know, automobiles, factories, uh, all these, you know, things that are generating all sorts of negative, in this case, climate <laughs> effects. And that we need to figure out not just how we as humans can can strike, but how can we get them to strike as well? Which you know, in another language, is something like sabotage or. How could we draw the bees in, and how could we relate to them in ways that spoke to these issues? It kind of reminds you of the old movie Birds, which I personally like, and. Uh, I don't have, uh, I think that, you know, I have a couple clauses in this long paper about that, but I don't have well-developed ideas about where to go and how to go there. I think Bruno Latour, who's one of the people that tried to engage in that other essay, is trying to think along those lines, and I don't think that he's pulled it, he's pulled it off yet, and I, I don't blame him for that, but I, I certainly haven't, I certainly have not. But I agree with you that, that that's a very uh, a, a pertinent uh, kind of thing. Uh, let's say, included in this idea of the general strike is a consumption strike. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a strike from work, but it's a consumption strike for a period of time, uh, but where you just need uh, the needs of subsistence uh, to uh, and, and, and uh, so that it really brings things uh, to a standstill. Because I, I grew up in a union family, and I was on pickup lines with my dad a lot. And uh, that that was great. Uh, and uh, if, if for General Motors, I'm totally left. Uh, that was great. But uh, but the just the labor strike is not sufficient. No, it can't be. And yours is you are broadening it out further. And I do not have an answer for that. But I'm I'm ready to listen to to, to work and thoughts about that because I should be since I'm developing this notion of entangled humanism. That's why you're posing yeah. the question. I mean. Uh, it was, uh, I'm here, three parts. Um, it's, uh, the notion of general strike um, tends to be uh, too general for a strike, for any strike to be. In the sense, the strikes uh, are always specific, right? Concerns, because the kind of cognitive mobilization that you need is usually driven by something immediate, uh, some, you know, people's lives are immediately at stake and whether it's Baltimore or whether it's Gandhian movement or any of the movement that we see, uh, there is a kind of certain emergency involved. This general strike seems too intellectual to, to be able to, con you know, to be conducted. So it could be an anti-consumption strike, but the consumption brings in so many other temptations that that kind of mobilization becomes very hard to pull off. So maybe I'm kind of missing the actual, you know, the thrust of of this, you know, maybe it's not as normative as, as I'm thinking it to be. No, you're not missing much. Uh, so, uh, so Sorel would make the distinction between the specific strike and the general strike, and he thought such a thing could be mobilized in <coughs> early 20th century Europe, and and some uh, in some places and times they have come close, but it's always a labor strike organized. And then, <coughs> then Gandhi's uh, efforts could be thought of as a general strike. Uh, and uh, it was towards building a nation. Uh, and so you're saying that strikes have always been built around specific <coughs> demands. And I'm saying, yeah, often something <coughs> more general than I think you have implied. But yeah, that's true. 
Uh, uh, so they're, they're, they're specific, maybe they have some general characteristics, uh, but uh, what needs to be emphasized today uh, is a, a short time horizon within which possible action could be taken. And those uh, earlier, uh, I should have give, given my paper on the general strike, I see, but uh, those earlier uh, 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 practices, even though they're illuminating and teach you a lot, they, they're not speaking with the age of extinctions. They're not speaking to that kind of age. They're not speaking to the, uh, the, the uh, differential effects of, uh, of, uh, of, of the Anthropocene today on different parts of the world. Uh, that's why it has to be across country and across regions. So uh, I, I would say that, that realism is on your side. But realism, my friend, is on the side of the point now. Uh, what we need is to explore possibilities in relation to the actualities of the current needs. And so, my friend, I you, but I convict you of passive nihilism. No. <laughs> I, I think that, that we have to think about possibilities here uh, that fit the needs, not probabilities, that, uh, that, that fit a, a history of practices. Because, because periodically in history, new things happen. New modes are developed uh, in response to surprising uh, 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 events. And, that, and we must become worthy of the events of our day. So I don't disagree with anything you say about, uh, the, about the history of strikes and so forth. Uh, but uh, I would emphasize that time horizon, the limited time horizon. And I would emphasize uh, how I have been sensing for a few years now, very few years, a certain emergence of a possible tipping point. <coughs> In the late 80s, there was emergence in several countries of a tipping point with respect to nuclear war and, and, and nuclear competition between the Soviet Union and uh, the United States and European countries. And it had a short-term dramatic effect that exceeded everybody's expectations. <coughs> Nobody I read before that uh, told me, uh, you know what, uh, you're going to... Uh, uh, it looks like there's going to be this glacial movement emerging and people are going to be able to enter into agreements we never imagined before. To the contrary, they were saying exactly the opposite. Uh, mutual deterrence is, a, uh, is, a, is the only way uh, to go. So that's an example. The, the, uh, the, the Indian example is an example. <coughs> but they're, of course, not perfectly geared to <coughs> It's improbable. That's what I said in my, in my own paper, this improbable necessity. We have time for one more question. Um, I'm wondering, I'm thinking of becoming a member, a third member of your Entangled Humanist Club. But I was just wondering, I was wondering, I was wondering if you could clarify a kind of a point for me. Uh, upon which a certain structuration of that premise is based, and I'm not sure whether I'm getting it right, and it concerns this concept of spirituality, and the idea that the, you mentioned that this concept of entangled humanism is needed because it promotes positive spiritual attitudes uh, for ethical and political reasons. Uh, and I have to admit, part of me is a little suspicious towards anything sounding of spiritualism, and I understand that we can kind of claim back the term the way we would claim it, you know, beyond certain you know, religious formulations from a very particular culture, and then we could reread it through different you know, um, uh, non you know, indigenous cultures. And, but I'm at the same time wondering about this human that uh, is a, provides a formal structure for this entangled humanism. So what kind of, um, what kind of value, what kind of decision making does this human embark upon? On what premise is that human carved out from that entanglement? Who decides about the moment of the cutting off of the human so that the human becomes that human who can make a decision about the positivity of those political and ethical outcomes, and are we not then returning by endowing that human with, with that spirituality to precisely the human exceptionalism and cultural internalism that we are slightly worried about? Yeah. And I'm not trying to cut you out here, 
It's the kind of questions I'm generally myself struggling with. And while I'm very much on board with the project of returning to the human in the spirit of the post-humanist yeah. critique, I'm just wondering what kind of, um, you know, how do we cut out or carve out, that notion of the cut is something I'm very fond of, the human from that flow without kind of returning to some of the things that we're wary of and criticized in, in other thinkers. Well, the, the wary of the uses of spirituality is part of it. It's, it's part, part of it. Yeah. Okay. And the looping of yeah. that yeah. is also part of it. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we'll have a long cup of coffee. But the, the, uh, uh, I advance the view that uh, creed and spirituality are inter-involved without either being entirely reducible to the other. Uh, and so and so that every uh, orientation to life, every political orientation, uh, every uh, 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 ethical orientation, every group uh, has a uh, spiritual or existential orientation towards the world. Uh, they could range from uh, uh, the horizontal which undergra underlies aggressive nihilism to a certain kind of gratitude uh, for the fecundity of being, which is what Nietzsche and Deleuze push. Now, Nietzsche and Deleuze are both atheists. So they play up the role of spirituality in ways that kind of exceeds any kind of secular uh, 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 orientation. And, and they, and they, and well, especially Deleuze is interested in, uh, in, in, in the ways diverse creeds uh, can, uh, can pursue spiritual affinities across differences. Uh, and, and that is the kind of pluralist assemblage that's needed today, <coughs> uh, especially with, with respect to a lot of issues. So, uh, who decides? Well, uh, yesterday, while well, uh, I was uh, uh, resting in my room, uh, uh, a few uh, hundred students and faculty members at Johns Hopkins said, we're going to march down the middle of the street towards the center of town. And they started their march. And yet, it's a conservative university. Uh, this, this kind of thing hasn't happened very often. Uh, they marched down uh, downtown, and by the time they arrived, there were a couple thousand people there. They just poured out of their houses on the way down. Now, that 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 is a, a, a cross a, a creedal, a spontaneous organization. And a, and a, and you, if you're pursuing the idea of a cross-country general strike. It's going to have some of those characteristics. It's not going to be ordered by, by people and so forth. And it will have surprising spontaneities in it. Uh, and after the fact, you'll say, I would never have thought that would happen. Well, I'm with you. You know, I would never have thought that would happen, but I'm acting as if it could happen. And, and uh, so, but I think the key move on um, this thing is that you don't have to give the word spirituality uh, to people who have had, uh, let's let's put it in in the most narrow terms, uh, uh, a, a faith in an omnipotent benevolent God, uh, and uh, and the word spirituality I think encompasses all uh, all processes and beings uh, in their relationships to each other, and I think that uh, people have been victimized by a kind of secularism that is blind to its own spirituality. I'm an atheist, or a non-theist, I call myself on my pleasant days. And, and, uh, uh, but I think that, uh, that, that playing up the role and significance of spirituality in all of the significant movements, and so then let's pursue these affinities across differences. Now Richard would say, uh, you gotta, you're going to have to extend this out, Conway, a little bit further. And you know, I'll, I'll try, but and I think it's a good idea. But so, uh, there has to be an anarchist element in this. We're going to return to this room in 15 minutes, uh, but in the meanwhile, I would like to thank William Conway.